pilot for the airplane. And they'll be going through the front and rear cockpit. And, you know, if you have a burning question, it's okay. Raise your hand. We want to be succinct. But, you know, if you really, if you see something that doesn't process, which could be 90% of this, I'm not sure. Uh, but just, you know, raise your hand and we can get into a, a simple discussion, okay? If you don't have any handouts, we'll give you some handouts. You can follow through the cockpit and make it a little easier. So without further ado, BC is the absolute high time pilot in the SR-71. Thank you. Hello, everybody. You might hold your applause till the end because you may not like it. Uh, anyway, this is uh, SR-71. Uh, still the fastest airplane in the world and probably will be forever unless somebody really, really rich wants to build another one. Uh, the first thing I have is a, a video that I want to show you about uh, the building of the SR-71, why it was built, uh, who built it, and uh, it also has some uh, nice uh, in-flight uh, movies that I thought was pretty nice. existence, it was already legend, the SR-71 Blackbird. It is a reconnaissance aircraft, a seeker of truth, that is without peer or rival. Shrouded under a veil of mystery and intrigue, the SR-71 is the fastest, highest flying aircraft in the world. These blackbirds can literally outrace a bullet, cross the length of a football field in the blink of an eye, or pass from Washington, D.C., to Los Angeles in under an hour. With its twin power plants each developing more thrust, 71 evolved from a need, a need to know. In the late 1950s and early 60s, gaining accurate reconnaissance data on massive foreign military buildups was imperative to the defense of the United States and its allies. The entire balance of global power was at stake. The problem was how to do it in the face of a mounting missile threat. The answer turned out to be revolutionary. Behind an almost unprecedented curtain of secrecy at the Lockheed California Company's Skunk Works, legendary aircraft designer Kelly Johnson and a small team of dedicated engineers and craftsmen began to shape aviation history. Beginning with their success with the P-38 during World War II, followed by the F-80 Shooting Star, America's first production jet fighter in the mid-40s. Then the F-104, the world's first Mach II fighter in the 50s, and the U-2 during the Cold War years. Johnson's team had consistently gone beyond what was then thought possible. With the creation of the Blackbird, though, even their lofty reputation would be taxed to the limit. Nearly everything that went into its construction had never been done before. Titanium forgings that had to withstand temperatures of over 600 degrees. The hydraulic system. The engines. Fuel. A life support system befitting a space traveler. 
emergency escape requirements that could operate at altitudes above 100,000 feet. Then, not copied or borrowed from something previously done. Of equal significance to the creation of the aircraft itself is the fact that the entire accomplishment was conducted in just 22 months. Unprecedented then, unimaginable today. As the initial Blackbird went through final assembly at a remote test site, its existence was still only known to a few select people. The public recognition it would later receive as a national asset was still years off. On April 26, 1962, Blackbird No. 1 successfully completed its first flight. through a natural progression process, many versions of the new aircraft were tested, including one model, the YF-12, which successfully demonstrated its ability as a missile launcher. Soon, though, national security brought its brief evolution to what we have today strategic reconnaissance aircraft, unparalleled for purpose and design. In early 1970, several years after President Lyndon Johnson first announced their existence, the Blackbirds hinted at their potential by setting seven world speed and altitude records, which still stand. Even more fascinating, perhaps, is the knowledge that those same aircraft are capable tomorrow of going out and breaking every record they now hold. In full service since 1966, today's Blackbirds are members of SAC's 9th Strategic Reconnaissance Wing at Beale Air Force Base in California. Though the times have changed, their mission has remained the same. Every time an SR-71 flies, it is an operation that involves many highly skilled people. Yet, the successful execution of a flight comes down to just two men. The reconnaissance systems officer who monitors the SR-71's vast array of advanced mission equipment. And the pilot who guides its course. They belong to an elite fraternity open to only a select few. to top off its tanks. The SR-71's twin turbo ramjet engines will produce more power than 45 diesel locomotives as it ascends to the upper reaches of the stratosphere. Cruising at speeds in excess of 2,000 miles an hour at altitudes above 80,000 feet, an SR-71 can survey 100,000 square miles every 60 minutes. It's multiple sensors gathering in millions of bits of information with each pass. Yet, for all of the SR-71's power and command of the sky, it 
remains an instrument of peace. It sorts the difference between what others say and what they do. And because its missions are still highly classified, the SR also remains today, over 20 years after its birth, a complete enigma, a mystery. And what many believe is the finest aircraft ever built. Now that uh, movie, of course, was made uh, 40, 40 years ago, I guess, when it was active. I do like the final moniker it had. It says that our mission was to um, sort the difference between what they say and what they do. And that, that, that was correct. Um, it, it was talking about the airplane is the fastest airplane in the world and holds a lot of speed records. Um, just, we just so happen to have the world's speed record, coast to coast, sitting in the back. Ed, would you mind standing up and saying hi to the guy? That's Ed Yielding. On uh, March the 6th, uh, 1990, he had the uh, honor and privilege to uh, fly from coast to coast. And uh, it was an hour and four minutes because he w <laughs> they wanted him to have extra fuel to do a little air show when they got there, so he was a... Uh, he had to uh, start his run s several hundred miles uh, east of the West Coast, but he could have done it in under an hour if he didn't want that. Um, that. This is the airplane. You know, I don't have a, I mean, I have a, a, a laser pointer, but it doesn't work on these screens. I've, I've tested it. I wanted to point out some things. That's a SR-71. It's a double, oh, well, the other one thing I want to say is that the airplane is no longer classified. The only thing classified about it are the sensors and the defensive equipment. And I think that's about it. Anything else, where we flew, how high we flew, what we did when we flew, all of that stuff is no longer classified. And, and that is a load off of my mind, I tell you. I, I was uh, contacted by a, a, a writer um, after I retired, retired from the Air Force. and. Uh, after the airplane was declassified, I didn't even know it was declassified. He wanted me to tell him some things about it. And I said, I can't tell you that, you know, <laughs> get out of here. And he said, oh no, it's been declassified. Of course, I'm not gonna take his word for it. So I wrote a letter to the uh, Secretary of the Air Force, actually the Secretary of Defense, and he put it down to the Secretary of the Air Force. And I got a nice letter that said, just what I said, that it's all declassified. I still have that letter in case someone comes after us. <laughs> anyway, um, some of the interesting points are that that chime, the uh, area between the delta wing and the cockpit, that's where we carried all of our mission equipment, uh, the cameras. The nose could um, accommodate either a camera or a radar. And we also carried uh, listening devices, um, ELIN, electromagnetic, anyway, the stuff that uh, when we, we would sometimes go 90 degrees to the Soviet Union, make a turn and skim their international uh, border by about half a mile. And all that time they were, they were bristling with uh, electronic data that, that we, uh, we covered. Um, here, there's a fine, uh, fine duo there. That's myself and J.T. Vita. J.T. Vita was an RSO. He was my last boss. He's the man who has the most hours in the airplane. He has about 300 more hours than I have. And um, he was an excellent guy. He was my last boss. RSO, the first RSO who uh, was not a test pilot and was not a pilot uh, to be the uh, chief of flight test. So he was a remarkable man. Unfortunately, he, uh, he, he died about three years after that, that uh, picture. These are the areas that we covered, and I don't like to say that we flew any mission uh, routinely. You know, you always say, he was on a routine mission. None of our missions were routine, I guarantee you. But that's the areas where uh, we, we, we divided the world into thirds. 
We flew out of California, uh, which we would handle uh, Cuba, uh, Central America, uh, out of Okinawa, where we would handle um, Vietnam and North Korea and China, and then uh, also Mildenhall in England, where we would operate around the Soviet Union, Murmansk, and the Baltic Sea. They were our primary missions. We also flew missions in the uh, far the, the Middle East. Here's a uh, <laughs> kind of a nice little uh, chart about the speed. Uh, Mach 3.2, and our, our maximum Mach was 3.3, so we could go even faster than that, it was uh, 2,211 miles per hour. And uh, you see what the uh, comparisons are. We actually were, honest to goodness, faster than the muzzle velocity of a deer rifle. Uh, the only difference between the muzzle velocity of a deer rifle and us is that we didn't stop. We kept that same, that same uh, speed for about an hour or so. Uh, I um, was kind of a, I, I was an aerodynamic guy, self-taught, and I, I knew that when you fly airplanes fast, uh, it generates heat. I did not realize how much heat it generated when you go Mach 3. This, uh, I would use a pointer, but this uh, chart, I was particularly interested when I came into the SR-71 program about what the heat uh, three feet in front of my my face was, and that is uh, right up there, 622 degrees. Uh, your uh, maximum heat on your oven is about 550. Cleaning cycle about 600 or so, and uh, so we were flying hour after hour with something three feet in front of our face that was as hot as your uh, oven on a cleaning cycle. If you can imagine flying an airplane in an oven. <laughs> and that's what it was like. Uh, there was uh, so much technology that had to go into that airplane. It's just unimaginable to keep things cool. Now that's a nice looking guy. Isn't it? I, I haven't changed a bit, have I? Yeah. Uh, that's a pressure suit, and uh, if I had a pointer, I would be able to show you all these things. We had uh, two independent oxygen systems you see on the helmet, because up at uh, 80,000 feet, you can't come down quickly. So uh, to us, fuel was less important than oxygen, pressurization, and um, uh, cool air. We had two independent uh, air conditioning systems, we call them packs and they, they would make the cockpit 70 degrees very very uh, comfortable there was one time on a mission i lost one pack and so i had the other one i put it to full cold and uh, i was not in a, in a position to come down um, and so i had to fly for about 40 minutes or so uh, at mach 3 with only one air conditioning pack the, Temperature in the cockpit did not get to 160, but it was about 130 or so. It got so hot that the uh, control stick was, was hot to touch. So that's, that's what heat can do to you. And um, if you lost both air conditioning systems, you could come down quickly enough that you wouldn't bake because the, uh, the heat rise is a function of the square of the uh, Mach number or the square of the velocity. So if you uh, decrease your uh, your velocity by half, go to Mach 1.5, you decrease your temperature by a factor of four. Um, this is kind of interesting, this little thing here. There was that on that sleeve and on the other sleeve, and those were checklists to do if you have to bail out of the airplane. So if you're at 80,000 feet, Mach 3, you could bail out, the pressure suit would be your cushion uh, to, the, to the blast, and of course you're, you're uh, ejecting into uh, 600 degree temperature, but you have a drogue chute that's about six feet wide, and that drogue chute attached to the seat would slow you down quickly mm -hmm. and also uh, tilt the uh, ejection seat so you would have a nice view of the of the earth as you fall down. Well, this would give you something to do, to run that checklist. 
Otherwise, you might panic or something. No, you know, I have something to do. I'll just you know, make, make sure that the uh, kid is out and everything. Uh, you all have heard about the uh, leaking on the airplane. That's what it looks like when you go out to uh, fly, usually. If you had the fuel tanks pressurized, as they did sometimes, the, yeah, that would uh, exacerbate the, the leak. But they say that it um, would uh, close the leaks after we got up to uh, altitude. I don't know because we couldn't see any fuel going out through our periscope. But we carried 80,000 pounds of fuel, and if you lost 1,000 pounds, it's it kind of lost in the noise. Uh, we start the engines with a um, usually with a Buick, two Buick Wildcat engines in tandem, with a uh, sprocket or a, a it would actually mechanically turn the engine. The reason you need that is that <clears throat> the oil and hydraulic fluids in the engine are so uh, viscous that uh, it's very hard to turn the engine. Uh, the tires were kind of neat in that they were uh, about 600 PS, no, 460 PSI. Uh, we had six of them. They were uh, very hard tires. Uh, if you had an airplane this heavy, you'd want nice balloon tires, but there was no room to put balloon tires in the fuselage. It, when you um, retract the gear, they go into their own little shelf, which is um, air conditioned, so you, the tires don't uh, get too hot. Uh, one thing about the tires is that since the pressure in the tires are so heavy or so high, uh, if you roll, run, run over a uh, rock or something uh, on the runway, uh, it doesn't give, it cuts the tire. So we were very, very careful to make sure that uh, as we taxi, we had somebody in front of us checking for um, what they call thought, for foreign object damage. That's what the cockpit looks like in the front. Uh, let's put that in there to uh, show you that we had, uh, we didn't have a lot of room, but we had enough room. And um, I, um, as myself, my preference is to fly an airplane with a tight cockpit, to kind of the old thing about uh, makes me feel one with the aircraft. Um, the, the way you get in, I would get in the seat, put my arms up on the rail, and you had two guys that would be strapping us in with all those connections and everything. And uh, I, I never knew them to ever make a mistake, for me or anybody else. And then after they got through, then the supervisor came in and checked and made sure that, that they did everything right. And there they are. We would usually do our pre-flight and everything, uh, start engines in the uh, hangar. The hangars were open at both ends. And this is, um, you had the, some guys pulling the chocks there. The crew chief is uh, saying, don't go yet. As soon as the chocks are out of the way, he goes to the signal and we taxi out. Uh, head on, the airplane looks kind of like a boat and that a, the most uh, efficient supersonic airfoil is a flat plate. You want it as thin as possible, and, uh, and you'll see that the, you can see the points where the uh, wings are. They tell me that that perspective, if, you, uh, if it were reduced down to the size of a razor, or if a razor blade were blown up to that size, that it would be thicker than, than that wing. That's uh, just a shot of the rudders. We had, um, you notice, all pilots would like center line thrust because if you lost an engine on something like this with the engines way out there and the engine pretty powerful, it gives a, a terrific yaw uh, moment. Uh, so to counteract that, you have two nice big rudders. And that's just showing the um, rudder check. Here's the cockpit, which you would advertise for you all to see the cockpit. And um, again, if I had the pointer, I could point the, the various things. These are, uh, these are unique. Those are inlet controls, spike and door. 
And they actually make the airplane flyable at Mach 3. If you didn't have that, you couldn't go that fast at all. Uh, we could simulate that while flying by, uh, we had two restart switches, and we could put the inlet in a safe configuration, which is spike forward and forward bypass doors open. And it would be like putting a speed brake on in a normal airplane. Um, the attitude indicator is that big instrument there. On top is another attitude indicator almost as big. Uh, we had them that size because uh, attitude control was so important. They wanted us to fly, when this was put in, uh, night, night, night missions more. So flying at night, look at it this way. If you're in a moonless night over the ocean, you're looking at black <laughs> and, and nothing else. If you are over a, a populated area, then the stars look like ground lights. So it's very hard for the pilot to discern for sure where the horizon is. Now, why do you want to know where the horizon is? Because one degree of pitch at Mach 3 will give you 3,000 foot per minute rate of climb or descent. One degree ain't much. <laughs> so it was very important to keep the attitude going. We had those two attitude indicators, then uh, the big one we could uh, select uh, two different sources for the uh, attitude indicator. We always flew in the ANS uh, section because that was the most uh, precise. Uh, the other one was an I I I ILS or IRS. The, um, then we had, in addition to that, over on the right side, we, we can't see it, but it's behind the, the right console there, was a peripheral display, uh, a, a PVD, visual, peripheral vision display, which would project a laser beam across the instrument panel. And that would uh, emulate and mimic the horizon. So if you were at night and you happen to be looking someplace else and you see this light going, that would be an immediate uh, cue to start checking your attitude. We did have an airplane that was lost due to uh, uh, did this before all of these uh, uh, niceties were put in. When the engine, when the airplane was first developed, they had the standby attitude indicator down to the left. You could still, you could see it, but it wasn't so prominent. Anyway, a little bit of attention, of inattention, could, uh, could get you in trouble in a big hurry because the airplane, when it's full of fuel, or even close to full, it's, uh, the airplane uh, is 107 feet long, so about 80 feet of that is fuel tank, and it's full, and it weighs 80,000 pounds. And when you go into a turn, or you pull G on the airplane, um, it's like, taking the center of gravity of the airplane and, and raising it. The more you pull, the faster you would raise that. And that would tend to have both sides of this moment arm, the uh, fuel tanks, bend down. And, uh, and uh, so we were limited to 1.5 Gs and we were supersonic. And that is not much. That's a 45 degree bank turn at most. <laughs> we usually didn't, uh, plan to fly more than 35 degrees of bank. That's a enunciator panel that has both caution and warning lights, and there's uh, 48 of those uh, modules. Uh, if one of them uh, lit up, it also uh, a uh, master warning would appear on the top of the uh, instrument panel. The yellow were caution and the red were emergency. Uh, for most of the red uh, conditions, we would have a checklist, uh, though we would have a checklist for everything, but uh, we would have to memorize uh, the steps and then call for the checklist. Uh, that would be a critical item. That's what the engine looks like uh, compared to a guy. It's about... Um, Here's what it looks like on the test stand. And that orange right there in the middle, that yellow in the middle, that's 
That's the uh, burner can, and it, it really it looks hot. So that's the way it flew, you know, for an hour, hour and a half. Uh, this kind of shows, I like this because it shows um, it's an airplane on takeoff. And most of the pictures you see of the SR-71 taking off, you can't really see the afterburner plume because it's daylight. Well, this was taken at night. Uh, it's Palmdale in the background. Uh, after we take off, uh, we uh, always climb an afterburner, generally. There's a good uh, look at uh, the kind of uh, angles that we could uh, climb at, though. We'd be looking for a tanker, and look, here's another tanker. This is a short video. It's a three-minute video. It's um, myself. I'm the SR-71 pilot. I didn't know at the time that I was being filmed. And um, the boom operator is a friend of mine, and he, <laughs> he had a friend with him, and they were taking this picture. And he was also cued into the uh, intercom system. So you'll hear the radio. It starts off, he asks where I am, and I'm not on frequency or something, and he says, Aspen, my call sign is Aspen 30, which is our training call sign. And he asks where I am, and I don't answer, and then pretty soon I do answer, and I say, Aspen 30, you're loud and clear. So that's, that's my voice. Just to show you what uh, what it looked like to do a rendezvous in broad daylight, <laughs> which was pretty easy uh, for us to do in broad daylight. Uh, you throw in uh, you know thunderstorms and uh, <laughs> dark nights and clouds and all that stuff. It, it really gets interesting. Uh, that's what it looks like to refuel. Uh, if you notice, the uh, pilot is well underneath the tanker. So if the pilot went like this, you'd be uh, eating a tanker, and that wouldn't be good. And so it took about 20 minutes or so to get a full load of gas. And the interesting thing about refueling is uh, when we hook up, we're about uh, 15,000 pounds generally. And uh, so we're kind of light, and uh, we, we can be a lot more maneuverable. Uh, we take on fuel that's more than our gross weight. So. The uh, empty weight of the airplane is 60,000. We bring on 80,000. So we more than double our weight, uh, or at least double our weight for the refueling. During that time, we're going, we hook up about uh, 320, maybe 340 or so. Um, then uh, we start accelerating as the tanker burns, or as the tanker offloads his fuel, he can accelerate. 
uh, we'll end up with about 350 knots uh, going. But we are, as the SR-71, we're behind the power curve. And that, what that means is that to go slower, it takes more power. To go faster, it takes more power. Now you're in that area where if you, if you reduce your, your thrust and don't do anything, you're gonna, you're gonna stall. Um, you never stall the SR-71. Um, so uh, we would have to, we would be power limited oftentimes. And my technique was as soon as I felt that I was hitting the military uh, stop, which is 100% uh, RPM with no afterburner, uh, then I would tell the boom operator, I'm going to light the left afterburner. We light the left afterburner because the left window is the only one that's de-iced in case you're in icing conditions. So I just made it a habit to do that always. So I say, yeah, boom, I'm uh, lighting the left afterburner. Put that up there. Go one potato, two potato, three potato, and then take the other throttle and move it that far, that far. And uh, then you, you would stay there perfectly. It worked. It was great. Rich Graham told me about that. That's what it looks like uh, on the boom, or uh, leaving the uh, tanker. How do I know? Because that center is the uh, fuel uh, vent from, uh, we always got full tanks. And so when you fill it with full tanks, there's always a little bit of slop that goes into the vent. That is a picture of a, a pilot that uh, I had that, this is a selfie incidentally, not because of myself, but I thought it was interesting to see we're about 80,000 feet and you can, the reflection in the visor uh, tells you what I am looking at. It's the blackness of space and uh, I'm about, as I say, 80,000 feet. That white is uh, just a cloud cover. And this was over Arizona at the time, I remember, remember that. Uh-oh. Here's, uh, this is a wide angle lens. I, I got a wide angle lens because you see a lot of pictures taken from the SR-71 with a 50 millimeter lens. This is a 25 millimeter lens. That, um, those uh, windows there are about that far away from me, although it looks a lot farther. Uh, I'm in a right bank. This is over at the, about the same time I took that other picture. It's over Arizona, uh, about two o'clock in the afternoon as I recall. Uh, that exas exaggerates the uh, curve of the uh, Earth. That, the curve of the Earth is not that way uh, with a normal camera. But up there, the bright speck up there is the sun. And we're, uh, we're above 96% or so of the Earth's atmosphere. There's very little air up there. And so wherever the sun is, it's extremely bright because the sun isn't filtered through the air. And in addition to that, where the sun isn't, there's not enough light to diffuse um, to the uh, light, so it's black. So you're looking at the blackness of space, they say. Very interesting. I really enjoy that. Oh, the horizon over there is about uh, 380 to 400 miles away. And uh, so if you are in the middle of the United States and you look uh, to your left and you look to your right, you're seeing about three quarters of the country or two-thirds of the country. Coming in to land, that's a pretty high attitude um, angle. And so we are a few feet above the ground. <laughs> and uh, judging exactly when you're going to touch down uh, took a little bit of practice. But uh, when we uh, checked out uh, initially, we got about five flights and then a check ride. And um, by that time, you knew where the, where the runway was. Uh, we always had to have a, well, we always used a parachute. The parachute was packed so tightly, you see there's a, right here, that's a, a small parachute and then another pilot chute, and then so it takes two chutes to pull out the main chute. And when the main chute is blossomed, it looks like that. And if uh, we have a, if we don't have a crosswind, then we would have the uh, parachute fully bloomed by the time we would uh, land the nose wheel. Landing the SR-71 was a, a multi-step uh, action. Come down, touch, as soon as you touch, pull a drag chute, one potato, two potato, homp, give you about a half a G deceleration, which really felt good when the, when the task was to stop. It really felt good. And uh, so then 
when you're in that configuration and you take the stick and you have to land the nose wheel. If you did nothing, that thing would slam down and the maintenance would be very upset. Uh, so you have to come and then land the nose wheel. Once you're on the ground, nose wheel steering on immediately. Let it test the brakes, let it slow down to about 55 knots, and then you uh, disconnect the uh, parachute. Uh, the reason you do that is because the parachute is fixed uh, over tank four, which is about where the center of gravity is. So that allows you to deploy the parachute with the nose in the air. If it were forward of that, it would tend to bring the nose up. If it were after that, it would slam the nose down. So they had to put the, the, uh, the buckle there. Uh, and if you uh, discarded the parachute below 55 knots, they say, then the buckle would tend to drag the length of the fuselage. And again, maintenance would not be happy about that. That guy, he's there again. Um, <laughs> we flew the T-38 as a companion trainer. And we flew that more sorties, of course, in the SR-71, but uh, as all pilots know, it's best to keep your hand in the flying business. The T-38 was a supersonic trainer. It go to about Mach 1.2 on a good day, and uh, we practice uh, instrument flying and things like that. Very important. Uh, there's a good shot, I think, of a, am I late? I have to stop. Barry says it's okay. <laughs> this will be very quick. <laughs> the comparison of the T-38 and the SR-71. We also use the T-38 as a uh, chase, a uh, pace chase airplane. That's the trainer. <laughs> that is a uh, picture of a SAM trying to shoot down an SR-71 over Vietnam. It's, uh, it's, I had the pointer, I could show you that. You see the the, the trail. That's, that was a surface-to-air missile that missed. Oh, that's where we flew, and thank you. <laughs> Thanks. It's a pleasure talking to you. presentation I didn't want to get up uh, I think we're kind of reconfiguring the slides mine will probably be just a wee bit more boring because I'm just going to show you what the cockpit that I lived in for almost four years and uh, what it looked like to me sorry about this microphone but there it comes Oops, I need a, I need a gizmo up here John is the guy who presented, I think, yesterday. Some of you might have seen him. Uh, and he built most of these slides, so I thank him very much for this. And that be me underneath it. But there is the spacious office that I had for about three and a half, almost four years of flying. Our cockpit was uh, significantly larger than the pilots. Uh, we couldn't see a whole lot, I have to tell you. And just so you know, behind the, the face there that you see was a bulkhead solid wall. I had flown in uh, 111s where you sat right beside the pilot so you could interact. On this thing, I couldn't see him. I could hear him only. And as you notice, that big space in the middle, there is no stick for an obvious reason. Uh, I had no need for flight controls since I couldn't see forward. So we did have spacious windows on the side but when you're at 80,000 feet, it didn't make a whole lot of difference anyway. There wasn't a lot to see. I was more involved in the cockpit anyway. So here we go. The backseater, uh, again, the training program was almost a year long. And it was uh, very, very, very demanding. And you got to know your buddy 
to start thinking like each other and the whole thing. So we always flew with the same crew. If one of you became sick and couldn't fly a mission, there was always a backup crew that could do it. So we got to knowing each other and it was just a remarkable experience for me. And I unfortunately just lost my uh, front seater uh, about two years ago and uh, I'm missing to this day. But to help him out, this is what the back seater had to do. First and foremost, we were tagged as navigators, so our main responsibility was making sure the airplane was on the line that the planners had drawn for us because that predicated the whole mission, everything we were doing. So you had to monitor the navigation. They called us as not navigators, they called us reconnaissance systems officers. So the next job was making sure all the reconnaissance instruments were supposed to doing what they were supposed to. We had cameras, we had uh, front and side, we had uh, radar systems. The radar systems were almost the quality of photos at the end. The early ones were truly blobology, but this one at the end was just a photo. Um, anyway, the, the monitoring that, and then we also had electronic intelligence collections uh, systems that uh, picked up both audio and electronic and everything. So that's how we learned about some of the new missile systems that the Russians particularly were having and stuff. So it was a, you were watching a lot of, a lot of goodies back there. And then if you got bored, your another major responsibility was as basically a co-pilot for the pilot with uh, running the checklists and particularly the emergency ones. I bless their hearts how those A-12 pilots, which was the predecessor to this for the CIA, was one pilot and how he could fly that bloody thing, do all of this, and particularly when he had an emergency, handle all of it, but uh, they did for a long time. But that was, again, one of the bigger things. As uh, BC said, uh, he would identify a, damn it, he would identify, say, a generator or something like that, and then you immediately go to the generator checklist and run it down for a read for him, and it was a, a do command action. And if he didn't do something, well, then you command and ask for it. The, uh, they were strapped on the pressure suit that he showed you, and. Uh, yeah, on, on both thighs on the pressure suit was the Velcro and the checklist, and I think it was passed around a while ago, uh, this big heavy thing that sits on your lap. You had a knee board for right-handed people on your right leg, and you could write stuff down. So it was a very comfortable, and you felt you knew what was happening. Then another thing that was rather unique to the SR was the communications from takeoff or taxi to takeoff uh, uh, all the way through the mission until you got back into the pattern where the pilot then knew what he wanted to do, he talked. But up to that point, the backseater did all the communications with the tower, ground control, air en route traffic control, the whole thing. So it was a, a good experience for us. And then uh, one of the last things was uh, monitoring all electronic countermeasures that we had to make sure. And uh, one of my classic missions that we had, we overflew Havana for the first time ever. <laughs> and uh, the Cubans went crazy and the back seat lit up like a, a pinball machine with everything indicating that they had launched. So we just push it up. We were already doing over Mach 3 and you just go a little bit faster and the missiles don't have a chance. We don't know uh, to this day whether they really launched, but it was a pretty good indication that they were upset with us. In fact, uh, Castro made such a protest over it that President Reagan said, well, let's do that some more. So we did one a week. <laughs> we did one a week for the next uh, two or three months, and it was uh, very effective. That's, it was an instrument of uh, foreign policy, if nothing else, because they could hear us, they knew we were there, and couldn't do a darn thing about it. So. We, we had a good time doing it. Uh, one of the guys uh, that was here earlier, he's gone now, but he was uh, flying in, I think it was 85 or 80, 84, 85, doing that uh, demilitarized zone along the uh, North Korean, South Korean border. The North Koreans actually did launch. They saw it, they saw it explode. 
but they knew it was coming, made the maneuver that was required. And the kicker with the missile is that uh, the end game is the critical phase of that. And when you're, you're, it's a bullet flying through the sky, as he said. And to try and figure out where that sucker's going to be, all we got to do is make it a little maneuver, and it just has to recompute all that. Well, the missile's already en route, and it just can't give enough command to do whatever we have done. So uh, it went off in the distance. They did see it, but that's the only one other than down in Hanoi. Those guys, uh, early ones in the 70s during the war down there, they did get shot at a lot, but again, nothing effective. There was something like 400, I guess, were launched at them, but nothing ever came close. So anyway, that was one of the last uh, features that we were supposed to do. I'll run through this fairly quickly for you, so not to bore you to death, but the, the critical things were obviously on the front cockpit uh, for, for flight. Uh, we had a lot of stuff on the side. This was some of our defensive gear and communication on that side. On the right side was mainly the navigation and all the sensors that we had. So it was uh, designed well for us. I think some of the planes in the past have had some issues, but this one, they thought through the process for us. Just a real quickie, this is, uh, I said I couldn't see forward, but I actually had what they called a view sight. And this is an electronic one. When I was flying, we just had a big chunk of glass, which happened to be a, uh, like a periscope, magnified so I could blow up the ground and everything. And it was actually, I had a better view than the pilot had, because I could see all the way forward, all the way around the airplane, and with good fidelity, quite honestly. For some reason, uh, some years after I quit flying, they put in this electronic, and it was basically a high-fidelity camera with uh, magnification on it and everything, but it, uh, our manual thing worked just, just as well, I thought. The, uh, the next thing is that screen in the middle, actually it's stuck to Velcro right there, and it comes back down and lays down in your lap uh, at about a 45 degree angle. And then the camera projector is down at the bottom. What the mission planners would do is they drew up the route and everything and had all these maps for us, but they just put it on 35 millimeter film and it would just progress along. I think there's a control somewhere, but anyway, it would just drag along and we could follow the whole mission on the map looking down at it without having a cockpit full of uh, charts and stuff floating around. And it had all your action points, all your emergency airfields and everything. So it was very convenient. And the pilot had a smaller version, but it had the same thing up front. I don't know where we jumped there. Um, just want to show you, probably, well, it'll come up later with a better picture. This was the, if I could read it there. That was the old map projector that he's talking about. Now, the one in the middle is actually the radar uh, screen that showed what the the radar system was imaging on the ground. And like I said, it was, this was a new one for after I got out of the airplane, but the, this one was as good as, uh, like I said, a photo. It was just incredible quality. So you could tell if it was actually working like it was supposed to. And then we had some controls for it. And this is getting into the uh, main stuff that we were looking at for monitoring. We were doing the flight fight monitoring like a, a good co-pilot, but we had the direction indicator at the top. The major thing that we looked at besides the attitude and everything, we had just a wee little bitty attitude indicator on the side, but the triple display indicator, which I think it'll come down and point to it, that's a heading. This is the one that we watched most, and it was giving us our, our altitude, our airspeed, and our Mach. And we were constantly monitoring that to make sure we were right on the money. And I tell you, when my pilot Lee would level off at 3.0 is what we usually did, that thing would set at 3.00 and just, just read right across. But it, if it's something started, it got distracted or whatever, but then the altitude, and they, like they said, it was a cruise climb profile. You leveled off about 73, 74 or so. And as you got lighter, you just went up uh, the slight, gradual climb. And so. It could get up to 80, 80 plus at the end of the mission. The, uh, where are we here? Oh, the other major thing that was going on was monitoring the fuel, not only the onload of the uh, tanker fuel, but also monitoring the center of gravity of the airplane, 
knowing all the parameters. And we had six tanks, and we had a CG indicator that we monitored, but occasionally, and we learned this in the simulator, it would lock up and you wouldn't know it. <laughs> and all of a sudden your CG is crypting way aft and you just pitch up and lose it. So you were very critical of monitoring it. And so what we could do is with a circular slide rule basically, go through each tank and load it onto the slide rule and then what they call spin the CG. And we could come up and tell if the CG monitor was an accurate. So it was, there was a lot of activity going on and we didn't, didn't get to sit back and enjoy. It was uh, something going on most of the time. And uh, just, uh, that attitude indicator and that was the fuel gauges that showed all the tanks what they had in it. A typical nice little 24 hour clock. But if all else failed, you looked at the, the manual clock. Now this side, uh, this is some more goodies for us. I'll get now, let me just jump down to these uh, lights down the lower left because I think it's an interesting story. The left one is called an alert and when uh, BC was talking about having a master caution light or something come up on front where he had an indication that something was going bad, that would come on to me to let him know if he didn't know it that something is bad so it was alert. The one on the right says eject and that's where if you had to get out of it that light when he was going to go I, his command was bail out, bail out, bail out, or eject three times or whatever. Well, that one, then in the middle, and you knew what to do with that, the middle one was an unusual light, but it says pilot ejected. So, <laughs> there, I only know of one situation where this happened, and we went from 1971 to 1989, 18 whatever that year is, years without having a crash. Well, this poor crew was flying out of Okinawa, going down to the South China Sea area, and they lost an engine, which caused a hydraulic loss. And they were trying to limp it. They got down to 15,000 feet, and they were trying to get into the Philippines. Clark Air Base was open then, and they were trying to limp it down there to land. Well, just as they got to the north end of the Philippine Islands, it just went crazy. The airplane just pitched up, well, the pilot obviously yelled, bail out, bail out, bail out. And then he waited and waited and nothing happened. So he said, screw it. And he got out. Well, the back seater happened to be bent over looking at something when the airplane pitched up. Well, that's not a position you want to be in when you want to bail out. So he had to wait to get back. And the airplane's coming over on its back. So he's, but he's at 15,000 feet. He knew he had time to do it. He just rode it out until he could get positioned. But during that few three or four seconds, he saw that light where he was in charge of the airplane, and that the pilot was indeed gone. So it, it works. Uh, the, uh, well, I'll just click through a lot of these. There, uh, we had, it tells you where the cameras are, uh, what they're doing, making sure they're doing right the frequencies of the radio, we had controls. Pilot had one UHF and I had the other one. So you could tell what they were all set on. Face Eat's an interesting one that uh, you set it, we had little wires going through our pressure suit helmet to keep it from fogging up when you breathe. And you quickly learn that as you exhale, it fogs over. So you gotta crank in a little, little heat you go too much, it's like being in an oven. So you, you got to temper it and make it right. But uh, it was very, very comfortable suit, beautiful. I felt like a, in a cocoon. It scared me the first time I put the damn thing on because I'm a little claustrophobic. But uh, once you got used to it, it, it was just a wonderful thing, quite honestly. Everybody else was out there sweating bullets over in Okinawa. And we're sitting there with nice cooling air going around inside and, and we could carry on forever. The um, cabin altitude, we had you know, a choice of 10,000 or 26. We always flew at 26, less demand on the system, but it's like being on Mount Everest. So it was uh, uh, an environment that you wouldn't survive in well without having 100% oxygen going. But uh, uh, we were at 26, the U2s were at 29 on their cockpits, and they had more problems with uh, Ben's nitrogen issues than we did. So 
3,000 feet made a significant difference in the cabin pressurization. Uh, again, another one of the sensor issues, and there's the three lights I was telling you about. Uh, I don't even know what that is. <laughs> oh, that's a crucial one. Yes, indeed. CG indicator. That's moved since I was flying it. It was on the other side when I was doing it. And uh, just more of the gauges as we come down. And our minimal enunciator panel, because our stuff wasn't nearly as critical as the 40 or so that he had up in the front cockpit. And this is just uh, a lower left side showing some of the things we had for the IFF that we have to deal with the traffic control when we fly. But most of the time, particularly on operational missions, we never even talked. We just taxied out when we were supposed to, took off on the time we were supposed to go. Air traffic control kind of knew where we were going to a point, and then we went off their scope anyway. But in the States, we would fly with that on. As we went through 60,000 feet, we would shut the altitude readout out to them so they didn't know how high we were, but nobody else is up there, so it didn't make much difference. And then the TACAN, which is just a navigation system. This side is, again, the backup navigation and defensive panel stuff. We had the, the little bucket of stuff on the right was how we set in a special code to deal with the tanker so we never had to talk to them. They could just tell how far, and we knew when we would start our descent down from 70 plus. It was usually about 210 or so miles back from where they were. They're flying a loop down the ground, and as we get closer at a certain range, they just turn and roll out down track, and we come right in behind them at about five miles is where we're supposed to meet up and then join up with them. And like PC said, it was nice when it was day VFR and all that. But you get into that stuff at night and weather, and you're you're looking and you can see where he is and you know the range and you just keep talking him in and keep flying, keep looking, and he's out there. We know because fuel was awesomely critical to us for loading because we, particularly on operational sorties, they always took us out to the farthest point and just get us back with min fuel basically. This is the basic left side. All the dark panels at the top are all the defensive gear that we had. We had capability for fighters, for missiles, and uh, a bunch of jammers that we had on board. Still classified some of the products that we had because they're still using that. But I felt completely comfortable. There wasn't a sortie that I would never have been concerned about flying. I think this thing was just in invincible. Uh, and not only with the speed and the altitude, but the sensors that we had on board were just incredibly good for disturbing those things. We had, uh, like I said, a UHF radio in the front for the pilot, one in the back for me. I had a high frequency radio. I think the pilot at the end, after I got out of the program, had a VHF radio as well. So we had plenty of calm to work with and to get going. Uh, all the controls, though, you had to set them and you had to talk to each other what you had going. Uh, the nav panel in the middle with a bunch of buttons on it, that was an afterthought from when I was flying. We didn't have a backup nav system like that. They threw in this inertial nav system, came out of a fighter, I think, somewhere, as just a means to, to get somewhere. But I had over almost 500 hours in the airplane, never had an issue with the nav system, and I'll talk to you about that a little bit here. But, I'll go through these things just to, that was to blow the canopy if you had an issue, the ejection system didn't work. And a few, few times that it was demand, demanded to work, it did. The guys always, we never lost an Air Force crew member. We had a few crashes after when they were early on in the program, but then we, like I said, we went from 71 to 89, 18 bloody years without a crash. So it was a good, good system and well worth it. That's the navigation, there's the radio controls, and lighting and stuff. Now this is where the heart of the navigation system was on this side. That big thing at the way at the top was just a, a control for all the radar sensors and cameras. But the big box about a third of the way down with all the big placards on it, that was the navigation system. And the reason they were big was we were wearing these bulky gloves 
and you, was, you couldn't dial like on an iPhone. You couldn't, couldn't hit with the finesse of that. The gloves were very tactile, though. You had good feeling in them and sensation, but they were just bulky. So that was the reason for the big, big buttons on that. So, and you could find it. And I'll get to the accuracy here shortly, but the controls on this thing were, were just amazing how accurate it was. And these are, again, more of the sensor controls that we had for uh, monitoring things. Only had a few circuit breakers. Uh, the interesting thing on that for, we even had an issue trying to see them, but the pilot was really difficult, and he had circuit breakers on both sides of the cockpit. And part of the emergency procedure, and some of them would be pull and reset a circuit breaker. Well, they're difficult to see, so what you tell the guy is, it's on the left side, third row back, up to, and he would just feel because he couldn't really see a lot of it. And then he'd go, oh Jesus, and he would pull it, and he hope he got the right one or whatever, and see what happened. And uh, it worked in the simulator, and fortunately we never had to do it in flight. So it was, the simulator was a good training tool. So that simulator would just wear our bodies out. I tell you, the stuff that they did to us, and they almost always concluded with ejecting because you couldn't fix it anymore. But the beauty of the thing was, they showed you every emergency that had ever happened in the airplane. So there was no surprises when you got out and flew, other than it flew damn well, and it wasn't a problem. So, but there was, there was never a surprise that somebody, oh, I've never seen that. It was, you had seen it all. But those circuit breakers, I always marveled at how they came up with that concept. This is the navigation system that we have. It's called, we jokingly call it the R2-D2. It's uh, the little box down the left is about four foot by four foot by four foot. And they would come out with a hoist and just raise it up and go in. And it fit in a can, uh, let's see if I can show it to you here. Well, it's already circled that little thing with the globe on it. That's right behind the back seat. seat. And uh, that thing would come down and have that glassy thing you see is actually quartz uh, because of the heat had a telescope that would look up tracking stars and as soon as you pulled out of the hangar you would go to nav on it basically and it would and they'd already had been aligning the system for probably an hour and a half or so before so they knew exactly where the aircraft was and it would just get it all nice and tight and as you taxied out you put that on to nav and it would start tracking stars in the daytime as long as there was no clouds up there in California, there was generally no clouds, so we would taxi out and get a green light that it was locked on in less than 30 seconds. The accuracy was bloody phenomenal. For something that old, it was like 300 feet is what they guaranteed that. And like I said, they had almost 500 hours in the airplane. I never once messed with that thing. It was so good. We tracked it, we monitored it, we made sure it was where it was supposed to be, but it was a hell of a lot more accurate than anything I could have done to make it better. So I never messed with it. It never failed. It just, it was incredibly accurate. Taxi back in, you're within 300 feet of where you started. The beauty of this system is, unlike today, with all the GPS balls and satellites that are out there, I got a feeling that's one of the first things if we ever get into another bloody war, they'll blow those out of the sky and there's gonna be a lot of systems that are gonna be limited what they can do. We were totally independent of any outside source for navigation or accuracy or whatever. So it's, they were, again, 63 technology. These guys were so far ahead of themselves when they built this stuff, it was amazing. Quick. Northrop, it was a, a Northrop product, I think. <laughs> uh, I guess that might have been it. There, again, it was a overview of a nice view and uh, comfort zone. But thank you very much for your time. I appreciate it. And if got any questions? All right. Jerry? Oops. Okay. For, what did we do for food? <laughs> Generally, we didn't fly long enough to be a requirement, but... Uh, we did have the capability, uh, U-2s did it, but most of the time. But we had, a, I flew a 10 hour, 10 and a half hour mission out of California one time. I took a couple of, they call it uh, tube food, 
it's like a big tube of toothpaste, but it was, uh, it, mine it had applesauce. Some you can have a uh, stew, you can have it in there. What you do is stick it through, there's a port on the side of the helmet that you stick this probe through, and then you suck the stuff out of there, or squeeze it, and you get it in your mouth. I didn't need it, quite honestly, in the flight, but I, what I used that mostly for was to itch my nose. <laughs> I carry two bottles of Gatorade with me, frozen, and you put them in the little containers on the side. Well, because it was 500, 600 degrees, and then around the cockpit area, that stuff melted real quick in the, in the container. It didn't melt the plastic, but it melted the ice that was in there, so I would slurp down a couple of Gatorades during flight just for the nutrients and all. But it was... Uh... <laughs> yes, sir? I would say 10 to 15 minutes. We'd start about 200, 210 back from the tanker and just a nice gradual descent. And the air traffic controllers in the States knew what we were doing, so they wouldn't generally mess with us and try to make us hold because once we started down, that was a fixed profile that we were going to fly. So it was probably 10 or 15 minutes before we rolled in behind him. Yeah. Overseas, we didn't care. We just, at that point, we went down and the tanker was waiting for us. Go ahead. Did you guys sign up? Oh, he had to volunteer, and there was probably, I don't know, 50 or so applicants a year. We'd only lose maybe one or two positions, so it was a difficult spot. They would, we would weed through a lot of the applications and then pick maybe three or four or five guys to come out, interview. It was like a week process. We had physicals and fly the airplane and fly the T-38 for trainers and the simulator for the pilots. The backseater got to jump in the simulator and do that. And it was a, a very productive uh, process, I have to admit. I, some of the pairings on the crews, I, I just still marvel at how well it worked out. It was like they were made for each other to start with. And it was just an incredible process. But it was very, very selective. I have to admit, I was very fortunate. Some guys didn't, particularly pilots, uh, had some resistance to do it because if they found something during a physical, it could possibly ground them. So they didn't want to risk doing it. But uh, the ones that we got were quite good. <laughs> I'm sorry? At 2.30. Oh, right. <laughs> That's what we, we talked to the tanker crew on operational message through the boom. And uh, normal stuff, we would talk about air traffic control and all that good stuff in the States, but not over the sea. Somebody had a question? There? Yeah. there we go. Not as much as I'd like to have, I have to admit. Uh, they flew probably one, one and a half times a week, maybe, if you were lucky, average. Uh, we all wanted to get out and do that, but he said we had the companion trainer, the T-38, as a backseater. That was a lot of fun for us because we could supposedly practice the crew coordination and everything, but we actually got to get out and fly and do some fun stuff. Because so, you didn't mess around in the SR. It was, that was a valuable asset, a national asset, so it was, uh, we did it. But the 38 was a fun thing. Somebody over here had a question? Yes. That code, that code that I said, to, he was asking, how do we find the tanker at night in the bad weather and all that good stuff? And it was a, a dicey sometimes, I have to admit. But on that similar code that we had between each other, we could get the range from each other, and we could get a, what they call a dither. There was a needle that pointed and told roughly where he was. It wasn't real accurate. It was kind of within our, within our area. And we would just try to drive in as close as we can get. And lots of times uh, with the weather, it was almost preclusive. But uh, 
we never lost a mission because of that. Uh, we were always able to find him. We probably pressed the limits a few times, but I remember one night off Okinawa, we got hooked up in the weather, got hooked up, and uh, my pilot says, B, tell me, tell me we're straight and level. And I said, yeah, yeah. He said, well, I feel like I'm in a 30-degree bank here. I'm behind the tanker. I said, no, 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 you're doing fine, doing fine, hang in there. Well, he got just a, a hint of vertigo while he was behind the tanker, and he, it just messed with his brain. And so I said, no, hang in there. I kept talking him through it. And after about uh, 10 minutes, well, it all kind of went away. And he said, okay, now I got it. And, and you get out in the clear a little bit, and it kind of gives him a reference. And that's why if the pilot hated to fly at night, I did. But most pilots really did not like to fly at night because, again, as he pointed out, the reference is over water, dark, and it was usually pretty damn dark over in Okinawa, it's China Sea there, uh, Sea of Japan, I guess it was. But anyway, it was, it was just very difficult to see. And so you had to rely on instruments. Well, he can't look at the instruments when he's trying to avoid hitting a tanker either. So it was uh, clear my brain. <laughs> Can I help you? And there was one mission where the tanker actually followed the plane to within range of an emergency landing in Thailand. Yeah. 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 Ye